everybody. Um, my name's Charlie. I work on the developer relations team uh, at Styra uh, and with the Open Policy Agent project. Uh, I don't know, there aren't a huge number of us here, but out of interest of those who are here, who's heard of Open Policy Agent? Uh, too. Um, so that's good. Uh, it's, it's quite widely used. It's the kind of cloud native default for um, policy evaluation. It's meant to be a general purpose policy engine for all of your policy use cases. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about, uh, as is alluded to in the first slide, like using WebAssembly and Open Policy Agent together and how you can run Open Policy Agent policies in lots of different places. So, and I'll link to a few different things um, as I go through. Uh, if you have any interest in um, following along on your own screen, then you can scan the QR code or look at this link as well. So, I'll start out um, with this question. Uh, what are policies when I talk about them or when I'm going to talk about them today? Um, so we'll, we'll all be very familiar with the kind of standard organizational HR compliance type policies where only admin, admins are allowed to do certain actions in certain tools at certain times or whatever. Um, particular departments have access to one data set but not to another. Uh, and when I say policies, like I imagine that's the kind of things that a lot of you thought of. And for the purpose, Generally speaking, when we're in the open policy agent world, I think that's the kinds of policies that we're working with. But uh, this is a talk about OPA and WASM um, and running policies in different places and running policies in places you wouldn't normally think that you are running policies. Um, so here's another policy. Customers can't book plane seats in row 13. Most planes in the Western world at least don't have a row 13. Uh, so you want, might want to have some rule in your application which processes plane seat bookings and says no uh, bookings in row 13. Here's another fun policy. Uh, when I first worked on this talk, it was, uh, it was closer to a certain time of year, but there is a product in the UK that is sold with this policy. Uh, the product can only be sold between January the 1st and the first Sunday after the full moon that occurs on or after the spring equinox. I don't know if anybody wants to take a guess as to what that product is. But Easter eggs, very good, yeah. So like, it's just a, an example of a fun, slightly unusual thing that you might not necessarily think of as a policy. And I suppose uh, my point here really is policy is more than just who can do what in an organization in a particular SaaS. Like policy is, is what businesses are built on. They define how businesses work and how, how, how the world works. So if we want to enforce these policies, if we want to make sure these policies actually work, we need um, something called policy evaluation. So in a general sense, this is how I think about policy evaluation. You have some policy enforcement point where uh, it's contact point with a user or machine, uh, and a policy decision needs to be made. So uh, you need to decide if a particular action is allowed. Should the Easter egg be sold and the date is in December, for example? Um, and then maybe within the same application, but somewhere else, some other part of the code or the system um, is the policy decision point. And it takes that data and using the policy that it's aware of, it makes a decision. And that policy decision might be informed by some policy logic and by some potentially some extra data. So when you've got the policy logic and the extra data and it's in the policy decision point, um, it, policy decision point can be queried for, for uh, policy decisions. So in a single application, that might look like this, where we have a, some web endpoint that a user is hitting. Uh, maybe they're, they're making a request to see whether the Easter egg is for sale. And uh, that handler, the, the piece of the application which is processing that HTTP request, um, that is making a, a, a call perhaps within, an application, within the application to some authorization module that says, you know, is this allowed or is this accepted? Is this passing, of the, poli passing the policy? Um, and that's been loaded with some rules that have been predefined and some, some maybe some role data uh, and a decision would go back to the endpoint handler. Um, so within an application, that's how that sort of, that's how that generic model of policy would, would look in a single application. Uh, in a distributed system, it looks much the same. Uh, we have one service, some business application which makes money, is referring to 
another service or another instance of, of a policy engine, perhaps, an authorization server, for example, um, and it needs to be able to make the decision uh, or is responsible for making decisions potentially for lots of different services. Um, so, and, and a similar situation again, the policy needs to be loaded in and the user data or additional data might be loaded in uh, in order for that authorization server, policy server to make, to do some policy evaluation in that example and return the result to the application. So those are two use cases for where policy can be evaluated. I'm sure at least one of those is familiar with something you're doing, whether you're checking access to Kubernetes clusters or enforcing rules within a business application around which users can do which things. Um, and I suppose the next part I want to explain is like how the open policy agent, um, how open policy agent fits in, in in those two use cases. So. But yeah, first, uh, is, is what, what is Open Policy Agent? Um, it's the open source project that I work on, but it's, it's a CNCF graduated project um, that is, pitches itself as a general purpose policy engine. It has a domain specific language called Rego um, for evaluating policies in all sorts of different contexts. Um, so I suppose the way that I like to think about it is uh, the open, open policy agent is more than just uh, a policy engine or is a policy engine can, um, that is made up of various different parts. One important part is the policy language, uh, which is called Rego. It's domain specific and it makes it easy to write policies. Um, some people find it harder to use than others, but uh, generally speaking, it is, uh, once you put your head around it, it can be quite an expressive way to write policy. Uh, there's a policy server, uh, it accepts requests over HTTP, and it can respond to policy queries uh, over that interface. Uh, but in addition to, and that, that's how it's generally used, and often if people are using it for Kubernetes admission, which I guess is maybe a common use case for attendees of this event, um, that's where the interaction with open policy agents stops. But uh, it's also important to mention that uh, you can use open in different ways. So we have a native Golang SDK, and we also have WebAssembly SDKs. And you bring all of that together and you get OPA, you get Open Policy Agent. So um, based on the title of this talk, uh, as you can maybe guess, I'm going to be going towards the WebAssembly functionality of, of OPA. Um, and really what, what brings it all together, I think, is the language. So I'll go do a, it, whether you're running OPA within an application using WebAssembly or Go, and whether you're using uh, it as a standalone policy server, you're using Rego. So I'll do a quick overview of, of Rego just now. Uh, so here's a very simple policy. It's about the most simple policy I could come up with. Um, and it, this policy will grant access if it is made, if a query is made uh, where the role that is specified in the query or in the input data is, uh, says that the role is, is admin. So we have a default allow false, and, uh, but allow will evaluate to true if the input dot role, which uh, in these cases are either role admin or role developer, if the input role is admin, then it would be allowed. Um, and that's a trivial, trivial policy. I imagine the you know, those of you here who, who work on, uh, in software development, like you could write that policy in any language that you've worked with. Um, and much the same probably applies here, uh, although I think this can be quite an, uh, a nice way to describe email validation. Uh, it's, an, uh, it's an example where we can use regular expressions, where we can deny certain substrings and, and so on, um, and produce output and evaluate policy around emails, for example, in a standard way. Um, but I wanted to quickly show a little example that's maybe slight, slightly more involved. So hopefully you can see this okay. Uh, but imagine that we've got some input that looks like this. We have a business unit or a request from someone in a business unit, say developers, and they're trying to request salaries. Um, and if we evaluate this, uh, sorry, if we evaluate allow at the moment, uh, we're gonna see that they're not allowed. Business unit developers is not allowed. But if we are the boss and we evaluate allow, uh, the boss is allowed to do it, um, allowed to access the salary data set, for example. And all of the, those decisions are based on this org chart data here. So we have a boss, and it's based on uh, different business units managing other business units. And I want to show how easy it is, or how, it, how you might uh, construct a kind of hierarchical access control for, um, for a series of different business units. So the boss, uh, 
doesn't, isn't managed by anybody, but the human resources business unit is managed by the boss, as are the developers, um, and the interns are managed by the developers. And each other business unit has a series of different uh, things that they are able to access. Um, so when we made the request for boss and business unit, uh, and, and asked, they asked for the salary data, we can see that, that that was allowed. So, and the reason that's allowed is because the boss uh, it manages the human resources, which have access to the salaries. So, first thing we can do is construct a graph of uh, of what these the edges uh, in this data set look like. I'll just quickly show you what this looks like. So, the boss manages developers and human resources. Developers manage interns and so on. So, you can see this is like a node, and then has edges to developers and human resources. And we can do that by selecting a business unit within the org chart and finding edges based on selecting any neighbor uh, based on who the managed by uh, field is set to in, in this data structure up here. And then we can also calculate the permissions for each business unit by, based on the graph, we can walk through the graph and find the, use the graph.reachable function in Rego to find any of the reachable business units based on the uh, based on the graph edges by following the graph edges here. So boss would go to developers, developers would go to interns and so on, and walk through the graph and find any of the permissions they have, and then go for each of the reachable ones, aggregate their access into a list of accessible items. So for example, here we can see that boss has access to salaries and so on. And then our, our actual allow policy looks very simple. We just say, we look up in the org chart permissions up here, and we say, if I'm the boss, do, is, is the input.request, so the salaries, is that in the list of access? Uh, and so again, if I evaluate allow, uh, we'll see that the boss is allowed. And if I put in interns here, we would see that it's not allowed. So anyway, the, the idea there is, is really just, oh, I didn't seem to use to exit full screen. Quickly go back to my slides. The idea is just to show that it's possible to express maybe slightly more involved policies relatively easily in Rego, um, or at least you can, even if you didn't find that easy to understand, which is fair enough, if you've, especially if you've never seen a language like that before, you can imagine that you might be able to express all of the policies you wanted to express in such a language. So today, the talk is about bringing that language to WebAssembly and how you can use WebAssembly modules that are based on Rego policies in your applications. Why would we want to do this? So, uh, the, the, the first thing is like, if you're if you're comparing it against the the distributed model where you're making a request uh, against an authorization server, potentially the authorization server hot has some latency, and one of the main benefits of running the WebAssembly uh, version of that policy within your application is that you can do it nearly instantly or at very little overhead. Um, so that's 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 an important um, important benefit. And that, that can translate to very fast feedback, for example, in JavaScript clients. Uh, it might allow you to standardize your policy. So instead of writing policy in JavaScript and in some other language on the back end, you can maybe use the WebAssembly module version of that policy in different applications and enforce the same policy in two different places or multiple different places. Uh, and it, allowing you to run um, those policies in different places uh, can, you know, that standardization can be quite valuable, particularly if you want to not just make standardizations around policy, how the policy is written, but also maybe how the policy is, a, is audited and um, or tested and things before it's uh, deployed and, and released. Um, potentially for very data intensive policies as well, you might see some performance improvements over evaluating it in the Go implementation. So I'm going to present a short demo now. Uh, where I will, will show um, a simple web application where I control, uh, configure uh, various different policies to, in a sample domain uh, around booking of train tickets. And so I'll, have, I'll, be, I'll be using this controller UI to update the policy as I go through. And then I'm going to have two applications. I'm going to have one is going to be a JavaScript client, which uh, is the form that the user is filling out to buy their train tickets. And the, the booking API, which is a Python server, uh, which the booking, JavaScript booking client makes requests against to make train ticket bookings. And both those applications are going to be using the WebAssembly version of uh, OPA policy that I have, that is compiled based on the policy that I've configured in, the, in my demo application, my demo sort of control plane, if you like. Um, so I'll just show this just now. 
So um, this is where I will be configuring the policy. At the moment, the policy is um, mostly empty. Uh, I have a name for the package, and I also have um, this uh, making use of this future keywords uh, import. But uh, as you can see at the moment, uh, the booking server doesn't have any bookings. And uh, on the, then I also have the booking client, which is what it looks like. This is the UI that I've envisioned for users booking train tickets. So, um, and if I, I click book tickets, it makes a web request which uh, will insert a booking in the booking server. And any um, policy that I make, if I make changes to the policy here, and then either, and I reload the policy in either the server or in the client, then the policy will be enforced at that point. So first, uh, let's see what the, um, what the, what are, what the how the application functions if I don't have any policy at all. I haven't loaded any policy into either application. So I can click book tickets. I didn't fill out anything in the form. And if I refresh here, we can see that we actually have a booking. We don't know what the email is. The passenger account is zero. The person is going from none to none, and they haven't booked any seats. So you, we, what we would like to do is to make sure that that um, submission is validated uh, correctly, and we're going to write some policy to do so. So the first thing that we can do is a very simple policy to make sure that the user um, has specified that they want uh, at least, that they're booking, making a booking for at least one passenger. It only makes sense for, for the booking of a ticket to happen for one or more passengers. So I've created this, I've saved this policy now. Um, and if I come back to here and I reload the policy on the front end. My JavaScript application has reloaded that OPA WASM module and will now enforce that when I try and submit the form. So if I click book tickets, uh, WebAssembly is, my WebAssembly implementation is, tel is telling me that I must have at least one passenger. So if I press uh, and submit one, uh, I click book tickets, it's now been accepted again. So, uh, but we can, add, we can extend our policy because we have, we have other things that we want to validate. So we validated the passenger count. Let's, um, let's go back to our um, email and, and validate that too. Uh, we've all probably written email validation far too many times, but I'll, I'll try and explain what addition I've made here to the policy. So we're going to make sure that the email matches this regular expression. You can judge me or contact me later about my email reg regular expression. Like There are a million different ways you can write email regular expression. This is the one that I've chosen to use uh, for this example. Uh, and we have a simple deny rule, uh, which will bind to a, a reason if the regular expression is not matched for the input email. And it'll say that the email must match the regular expression, because all people who are booking train tickets will understand uh, the, the regular expression that we send back to them. Um, also, we make sure that users don't submit uh, requests with example.com emails, because that would be uh, not allowed. So if I uh, reload the policy again, uh, and I try and book my tickets, it says, Ah, oh, yes, the old favorite email regular expression. I'm going to have to fill this out. Um, and I'm going to put in for now example.com. And now the other, part, the other rule is firing and telling me that I've got this other problem. Uh, so I'm going to have to change it again. So I'll put my real email in this time. Uh, this there we go. So now I should be able to make a booking. It says OK. Uh, and we can see that the first booking with uh, some valid data has actually made it through. Um, come back to here, and uh, now let's do some validation on the route. So we saw the uh, none none route that we had initially. I'm trying to select this and running out of fingers. Here we go. Um, and we want to make sure that users are booking valid journeys. So if I update this, quickly talk through this one. So we want to make sure that the user has selected that they're not going from, they're going between two different stations. They can't depart and arrive at the same station. We also want to make sure that, so none is the value that's bound to when they don't select. Uh, so we want to make sure that uh, they've selected both val val values for both these fields. So if none is in this set, then we will return this message saying that the stations must be set. But we also want to do something interesting, which is to check that tickets are booked within the same area. So you can't book a ticket from Amsterdam to Tokyo. Uh, you can only book tickets uh, from Amsterdam to within Europe. Um, so now if we come back here, and um, we do reload policy again, uh, try to submit the form. It says departure and destination stations must be different, and they must be set. So let's choose Amsterdam, and let's see if we can book from Amsterdam to Tokyo. It says, the route must be within the same area. Amsterdam and Tokyo are in different areas. Uh, so I'm going to go and 
update this uh, to, say, Paris, and we should find now that that's been accepted and has been booked. So um, finally, uh, we also want to do some validation on the seats. And I had this interesting idea, which was that you should book, as part of your booking, uh, you should book only adjacent seats. So let's see how we define that. Uh, the first thing we do is we check that the number of seats matches the number of passengers that's being selected. And uh, the next thing I define is a series of seat, adjacency, uh, seat adjacencies. So this is seat one, two, three, four. Um, these are all next to each other. So seat one is next to two, three, four. And seat two is next to one, three, four, and so on. And here we use the similar graph reachable function to, so well, the first thing we do is we find a set of the seats uh, that the user has selected, and then we choose for some seat, find me from the starting point of the seat that we've selected within the seat adjacencies, find me all of the reachable seats, excluding the seat that's been selected. And if the reachable seats intersected with the set of seats that they selected in total is empty, then we can say that the seat is not adjacent to any of the other selected seats. So if that didn't make much sense, I'll try and explain it with an example. So I'm going to refresh and click book tickets. So the first thing it's warning me is I need to select one seat. But if I'm just going to up this to four so that we have to select some adjacent seats. So if I now go and choose a different seat over here, so let's say that I book, try and book these seats, it will tell me that this is seat nine and it's not adjacent to the other seats. So I'm going to put that, um, make sure that all of the seats that I've selected are adjacent. Um, and then that's allowed. That's OK. And now we've, we've got our final completed validated booking all the way through. Um, but what I'm going to do now, just to show you that it's all the same, is I've refreshed the client application so the policy isn't there anymore. There's no policy evaluation happening on, on the client. But I'm going to reload the same policy uh, on, the, on the server. And I'm going to submit the empty form. And you'll see that all of the, uh, all of the um, same rules are now enforced, but the error is coming from the server. So I'm running exactly the same policy, and I'm running that on the server or on the client. And it's coming from the same point. And it's exactly the same WebAssembly module which is running in both applications. Uh, so that's, that's the demo. Uh, it's, it's the best example I could come up with to show how you could use exact, precisely the same um, you know, precisely the same code logic for the policy, but in two different places in your stack. Uh, and hopefully, you can see how that, that might be valuable. Um, so that's that. Um, I think it's maybe a little bit interesting. It was interesting for me. Uh, so hopefully, it'll be interesting for you just to talk about how the relationship between the open policy agent project and WebAssembly has been over the past and where we are today, what you can use, and um, where we're looking and what the roadmap looks like, or, or um, you know, where we might go next if we had infinite time, developer time. So um, in 2018, uh, the team, this is long before I joined Styra, um, and actually about a year before I started using open policy agent to begin with, uh, the team worked on a proof of concept um, there were some challenges where it was un where the use case made it impossible to use OPA as a sidecar, which had been the kind of, and is still the predominant way to run OPA. You run it as a sidecar next to your application. The application consults it for policy decisions. Uh, when you're running in edge locations, um, this is this functionality of a sidecar is unavailable to you, or typically unavailable to you, um, especially in a kind of ephemeral serverless environment. You don't really know how your code is running. You don't have control over which container, which process, and so on. Uh, and you know, this was like quite a big area at the time, or lots of buzz around this. And there was a proof of concept put together at that time. It's like, what would it look like if you could run these policies in WebAssembly? Uh, and this, this blog post uh, is a sort of write-up of the, that early experiment and the performance uh, improvements and things that we saw at the time. Uh, and around about that time, we also released the first SDK for making use of those OPA WebAssembly modules from within Node applications, uh, which is the same or a later version, but the same one I used in my JavaScript client today. And so that's kind of like how it got started and why it got started. Uh, and I think that use case is still quite valid, really. Um, where we are today is that we've got um, quite good support for not only evaluating or um, evaluating those 
uh, terms of regular policies, but also for building and distributing um, those uh, WASM modules to policy agents or to else wherever you need them. Uh, that's something that has come on uh, in that time. We also have various um, SDKs to the, which for, for different languages which wrap the OPA WASM modules that are produced. And um, we also have, um, so the, the, the feature parity between, you know, I made use of that graph.reachable function, that's something that's, that is available within the WebAssembly implementation. There are other built-ins to the Rego language which are only available in the Go implementation. Um, we have around 50% coverage within in WebAssembly, which is a number that could be a lot higher, um, but it's also a number that could be a lot lower, so uh, glass, glass half full, um, that's where we are anyway. Um, a lot of the Rego built-in functions depend on Go implementations or are very um, dependent on like the Go way of doing things. So the kind of um, string formatting and things like that uh, inherit the kind of Go semantics, which don't necessarily make sense in a lot of other languages or require more implementation um, and, and so on. So uh, there's some uncertainty about how to do that consistently, but there's also you know, um, only so many hours in the day. In the future, uh, these are some uh, some issues that I'd like to highlight as potential uh, future improvements. Uh, one of the main challenges we have at the moment, or, or things that makes using WebAssembly OPA difficult at the moment, is that uh, we don't have good options for accessing shared data within concurrently running WebAssembly modules. Uh, that's something that's kind of based on the state of WebAssembly in the 2018 era versus now. It's something that we could address. Um, also to do with like uh, automatic, making it such that there's like a first class citizen of uh, a target to deploy a OPA WebAssembly module that's compatible with the Envoy proxy would be very valuable. Um, and in addition to that, uh, it would be nice to be able to implement plugins so not uh, this is, this is going, to be going slightly away from like the Rego evaluated as a WebAssembly and back into like extending the open policy agent, which is currently implemented in Go. Uh, maybe you could write like higher performance uh, Rego extensions, which would be evaluated as a, via a WebAssembly module. I think that's a particularly exciting one. Uh, it's slightly different from the topic I've talked about today, but I think it's a cool one. Um, and obviously, like I mentioned, we cover 50% of the languages existing built-ins in web WebAssembly. It would be great to improve that number. Um, yeah, like it would be really cool if people were interested, if there's anybody here who uh, would be interested in contributing to this part of OPA, that would be great, really cool to see. Uh, there, it's an area of the code base that could probably use some uh, love and attention. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's all I have for today. Um, this QR code uh, will take you to the first link, which links to all of the other links, uh, and that, that will be there. It's a little page on my website. Um, so uh, yeah, and uh, you can get in touch with me. The writing is actually quite small at the bottom, but um, you know my name, you can look me up. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, take any questions if I've got time. Thank you. Uh, yeah, go for it. Oh, uh, yes, uh, there you go. Okay, uh, I was thinking this this uh, component of yours is uh, for authorization, right? Uh, so it analyzes some policies and check if you're able or not able to perform some action. Yeah. Have you ever imagined it uh, associated with an uh, identification process like with just web talk, web talk and so to retain the information of the identity of the person? Mm -hmm. I'm able to perform this action because I am John Doe. Yeah, so, so we have, uh, so OPA has support for parsing uh, JSON web tokens. So any information which you're uh, including in a web, JSON web token, you can use in a policy that has been provided the web, JSON web token as input. So it's a common uh, thing that Envoy uses of OPA. So OPA has a native integration uh, where we support the Envoy external authorization API. And often people over that API provide some information about the request, including a JSON web token. You could write policy that makes use of JSON web token to make decisions around whether or not the person's allowed. Um, yeah, if the, if the token itself pr provides the information you need, then that's great. You parse it, you use the information in the token. Um, we have, uh, OPA has support for like uh, validating the authenticity of the token and so on as well. Um, so if you are relying on those authenticity checks on the token, uh, you can look at the data in the token and make the decision using that alone. Uh, that's fine. I suppose often 
that's you might want more data, uh, which is a different situation, and OPA has functionality for that too, but yeah, you can use tokens. So for, e for example, the component can perform uh, external calls to other authentication systems to analyze yeah. the token, so for example? You have, a, you have a few different options. Uh, within the open source OPA, you have HTTP send, which allows you to make a HTTP call at policy evaluation time. Uh, generally speaking, we would advise against that unless you absolutely had to, or unless it were to another local sidecar or a local service that was co-located on the node for latency reasons. Uh, but it is a function that's there for you if you need it. Generally speaking, uh, we advise users to uh, replicate the data to the policy agent so that the data is available when it's needed. Um, that might be uh, you know, like a, a list of documents that a user is able to access or something like that. Uh, if that data set becomes very large, like there are some enterprise options and things around how you might handle that, but generally speaking, it's better to try and bring the data to the policy engine so that it's in loaded in memory and ready for that time of policy evaluation. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Any other questions? No? Okay, well, Thank thanks you. very much. Thank you.